So I'm pleased to welcome Kartik. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. So well, hopefully everybody is able to hear me. And uh, I'm not too deafening, perhaps. So you might be wondering, you know, what, I'm, what exactly I'm talking about when you say supply curves, it's semiconductors, and I'm a mechanical engineer. But I have worked on a very large variety of problems over time. And it is just a matter of, uh, as Thomas Edison said, when opportunity comes at your door, it comes dressed in overalls and looks like work. So, you know, whatever opportunity you get, you just take it. And uh, you get to do many interesting things. Because I, I guess I actually knew business much better before I started off on all of these things. Because my father was a true arbitrageur selling industrial yarn. And uh, I learned the ropes of his business well before I learned any engineering. So this is a very fundamental set of questions that we're asking and answering. First, we'll do some analysis in the sense of what are these supply curves and how do they work out. Then the next question, of course, is for the engineers, how do you actually build them? How do you make it possible? So if you look around, many things that we have today are quite expensive. And uh, what I'm claiming here is we can actually make them a lot cheaper. How? When you buy your uh, desktop PC or something, the price of the desktop PC is close to the scrap value of the material. Why can't we have a car for $500? Why can't we have a Cessna for uh, $20,000 or something like that? So the question is, why, why, why have we not made all of this progress in all of these areas? Because all of you are making great breakthroughs all the time. You're working extremely hard. How do you recognize where to put in all of that effort and what sorts of problems and questions to put that effort on so that you get a huge bang for that buck of your efforts? So as a stock picker, this might sound familiar. You know, it looks like a lot of Warren Buffett. Most of his stocks you know, look like this. So you have a nice exponential curve, and everything keeps going up, up, and up. So there are many reasons they can go up. Of course, uh, creative accounting is possible. <laughs> it's also possible to do other things. It's also possible to have uh, an expansion of the market as you expand more and more, and you have a product productivity difference between yourself and everybody else in the game. You've got a little bit of a compound interest coming to you over all of your resources. So, I mean, everybody in the venture industry knows this business of high utilization minus low overhead, and that's how you evaluate all of your companies. But the question is, what is the mechanism behind all of these curves, and specifically in technology? Because if you're looking at regular stuff, it's maybe finance, and it's maybe you know, a monopoly power, or uh, connections to the government, or the political system, and so on. But in tech, it's very different. And in fact, tech gives you huge returns. This is a logarithmic scale graph, and you can see this is an exponential curve, essentially. And uh, in the 90s itself, of course, the investors figured out where all the money is going to come, and how much it's going to go, and how far it's going to go. And uh, after that, things have, in fact, saturated in a relative sense. So those are all these Moore's Law, Moore's Law companies IBM or Applied Materials, and uh, NASDAQ itself. And you can see that their curves are very much similar, very much similar, isn't it? There's not much of a difference between them. They're all driven by the same thing. So cramming more transistors and chips drives all of them. So that's the basic idea, whether it's Intel or IBM or Applied Materials. And in fact, there's some sort of synergy to all of these things. So let us first look at you know, how this thing works in memory, where a lot of progress has taken place. So if you look at this curve, you've got one slope here. This is an exponent. This is another exponent. This is a third one, another one, and then another one. So you can see there are many exponents, not just one. So they all represent different technologies. You had the old big disks, and you had floppies. You had uh, CD, ROMs, and the like. You have the modern hard disk. And then you have uh, solid state, the hybrid of solid state, and the regular hard disk. So all of these things are basically 
lifting the industry up, up and away. And the next question that arises is, what is the engineering basis or what is the scientific basis of all of these things happening? Because the curve is nice and it would, wouldn't we all be happy if we had that in our industry? How do we get that? So this is a very crucial slide where I've put in all of this information on the notion of supply curves. So they represent the interplay of interdependence and modularity. So let us go through all of these notions. First, interdependence is if all of the components inside a system think, I don't know how many of you have worked with mainframes. It was a long, long time ago when I actually had to program those things. It was a pain. And uh, they were all totally integrated. And, uh, you know, you really could not break it up easily. One company made everything, like IBM or uh, DEC. I guess most, most of those companies are dead by now. So this is the notion of the supply curve. As performance per dollar increases over time, and then, of course, you can have different supply curves. But what actually produces them? You have a research phase where the hard problems are being solved. You need, you know, really smart teams, or it takes a lot of trial and error. And there is this misconception that smart people solve the hard problems. Usually it is not the case. What happens is this, the people who do the last 10 experiments out of the 100,000 or a million are the ones that make the money. So you have to recognize that. And research, that's why research is a high-risk business. And then you have new industry once you're sure enough. And then for a venture investor or even an entrepreneur, You've got to figure out, you know, do you know that you're in this stage? Because that's the stage to be in if you want to invest a lot of money. Because until then, you really have to think hard about the problems. We'll get later into the mechanisms of how that happens, the engineering mechanisms and so on. And then you enter the growth phase where you have rapid growth and rapid returns. And once, usually these things happen in sets, isn't it? There's many industries and they all compete and they keep climbing up that supply curve. And Clayton Christensen, I guess, uh, formulated some of these things in his Innovator's Dilemma and other related books. And after that, you are in the stage of maturation where you put in a lot of effort, you solve hard design problems, and you don't get very much of return for all of the work that you're putting in. And at the end of it, you have the stage of senescence. And what, what happens there is you're putting in more and more constraints on the existing problems. So when you put in more constraints, think of the joint strike fighter. Unfortunately, I mean, I've got my stuff on it, and it's getting massacred because you're trying to make it all things to all people. And when you put in so many requirements, you're not going to get that performance. You're not going to get any of them met. Okay? So when something goes up and then people keep putting more requirements, performance goes down. And in many crucial sectors, when that happens, life gets dangerous. So this is this whole notion of the supply curve going. And what is this notion of going from interdependence to modularity? You have the mainframe, and then you have the PC. So if you're the first person to make the PC, you know, you know how to make the thing in a modular plug and play fashion, and nobody else knows it. Therefore, you're actually able to sell right, for a good price and make a lot of money. And that. Over time, everybody else makes it in a modular fashion. Right now, you, know, you really can't make very much of money make, building desktops because everybody can get instructions off the internet and make really good desktops with just electronic components. So as you go from interdependence to modularity, everybody else knows what to do, and then you have the whole industry. Different people make different components. You got people making keyboards, people making monitors, people making the CPU, the operating system, the memory, and so on. So all of those pieces. And because different people are working on it, and you do not have the same, you do not need a large team working on everything. If you need a large team, then it's, a, it's got a huge overhead. All of those people have to communicate. They've got to speak to each other. And they've got to solve all these problems together, right? Thrash them out together. It's very difficult. And that is why things are expensive at this stage. But once you get into this growth stage, you know, once you make it modular, and lots of people are competing in that same field, prices go down. So let us look at why exactly is Moore's law dead in a sense. It is not dead in the sense of we are still able to pile more transistors into a centimeter square, but the cost 
the relative cost per component has stopped going down from 28 nanometers, which is about 10 years ago. So Moore's law is not a law of nature. It, is, it arises from optimization. And here you have this wonderful you know, symbiosis of many different industries, the people who are making the equipment, the people who are making the chips, the people who are making the software, and all of these things. So that those costs have been driven down for those 40 years. 1965 to 20, 2005, roughly speaking. So it is a function of optimization. And we're all doing optimization in all sorts of businesses. The question is, when can we do this sort of thing in a sustained fashion, year after year after year? Right? And if this is more flying and it has ended, you know, when do you think we were really creative? Because everything that we have today, all the so-called innovation, is essentially just the application of the microprocessor and memory in all sorts of systems. We really haven't developed anything fundamentally new. And I'll show you why and how. Just look at all these exponents in different industries. Moore's law was 46%, isn't it? That is why you could have an industry that developed extremely fast and so fast that the politicians could not figure out how to regulate it or destroy it in any fashion, isn't it? So it's very important that we have these growth industries. If we do not have growth, if the growth is slow, then it's going to get heavily regulated. The big guys are going to ensure nobody else gets in there and all the innovation basically dies out. So it's, it's a powerful dynamic here. So look at corn yield, you know, that's you know, one of the major food crops, just 2%. Lighting, lumens per watt, 2.6%. And 3.1% outdoor. Steel cost, we went from 50 megajoules to 20 megajoules per kilogram over all those years. It's not very much. Steam generators, travel speed, it really stopped going up after 1958, you know, the first wide-bodied jet. Auto fuel efficiency, you know, a very, very slow curve. So if you look at it, most of these industries are in the stage of maturation, you know, almost flat, the curves are almost flat. Okay? And that's why, you know, we'd, we're really scared of what's going to happen in the economy and so on. And in fact, we do have negative exponents in many places in education, in healthcare, in government, because education is trying to do too many things, again, too many specifications. You really have to you know, handle those specifications, perhaps in a different fashion. The old system is going down in here simply because we are asking it to do too many things. You know, we want people to learn things, we want them to play sports, we want them to uh, be cared for, and uh, we want to do babysitting and all sorts of things right in the same place. And perhaps that's not, that's not possible. And the same thing with healthcare. We are trying to solve all problems for all people with the same system. Okay. So now let us see when we were actually creative. Just look at that. Every industry that we see today, almost everything, you know, came off in the 1880s. Look at that. You know, anything that you can think of, all the industries that you've got. So it started at the time, and then over time, you know, it sort of gradually tapered off, and then, you know, tapered off in the 1940s and probably died out in the 1950s. We really haven't made very much of fundamental progress after that point, except for the microprocessor and memory. The other question is, you know, are we all a bunch of, you know, morons or something? You know, those guys did so much, and why haven't we? So, look at all those people who did these things. I've put in a bit of diversity in terms of disciplines. You know, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, very recognizable. The Wright brothers and their sister, you know, because their sister was quite important, and the Wright brothers acknowledged her contributions as much, because without her, you know, they couldn't have done as much. And Luther Burbank, I guess everybody's eaten potato chips, isn't it? So, he's the man that developed those potatoes the Burbank potatoes, all right? And uh, of course, Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, Kurt Gödel, because uh, Einstein said he went to work every day for the privilege of walking back home with Kurt Gödel. And von Neumann called him the only indispensable mathematician of the 20th century. And of course, von Neumann is the man that created all of our modern world, computers and numerical algorithms and all of those things. And if you look, I, I don't know how many people recognize Hedy Lamarr, 
because she was the one that invented spread spectrum communications. So it's been there for a long time. And everything that's happened since the 90s is just very incremental. The fundamental idea was developed a long time ago. And the thing that differentiates all these people is they were very self-driven. They were in different kinds of positions, no doubt. But they were all self-driven and self-motivated people. They were not parts of any bureaucracies and they were not parts of any particular system. They were very independent and strong-willed people. And the question is, how do you let such people thrive so that we get these kinds of results? So the question is that, is, that is one side, the people. The second is what creates all of those new supply curves. Let us take a look. The biggest supply curve that we really have, when we are using the English language to communicate across the world, it's a language that is driven by the market. So words, the meanings of words are not determined by politicians or academies or bureaucrats. They have been determined by people over time. That's why English is a very hybrid language. It's taking words from all sorts of languages and putting them together. So that's the biggest supply curve that we really have because that's what makes possible the entire world of commerce that we, that we have now. The second is the building of the American system of checks and balances. So what I'm looking at here is you reduce uncertainty for a system and then if you reduce certain uncertainties, you have many people able to work through it. Because of the American system, we're able to plan for the long term because the American system is designed for gridlock, meaning legal stability. So that's why when China is crashing, all the rich people send their kids and their money here. And uh, the same thing with Europe or Japan or Korea or anybody. So by building legal stability, and also we have actually exported this system throughout the rest of the world. In fact, if you look at it, almost all of the ideas of what we call modern civilization are developed in the United States. It is, it is true that there were people in Brazil who made airplanes at the same time as the Wright brothers, but that society would not permit the scaling up of such ideas, right? And uh, you also have all of the stuff that I did, not such big supply curves, but relatively small ones. Because whenever you try to solve a problem, a relevant problem, with rigor, you're able to solve, you're able to do something really interesting. Probably the last thing that I've done, you know, might get rid of GPS in a few years. So we'll see. So we want to understand the mechanisms. So as we saw, you know, at the top, you have increasing utilization. If you write a novel or make a hit movie, you're going to make a lot of money, straight. And... Uh, Computing and organizing makes a lot of money. That's what software is doing all the time. Okay? And on the other hand, if you want to solve more and more fundamental problems, for example, if you wanted to make a flying carpet, you've got to figure out the physics and the mathematics and the engineering, you know, and you've got to figure out you know, how you're going to keep it safe, and you've got to figure out how you're going to keep the network safe when everybody is using flying carpets. right? So that's a hard problem. Whenever you try to solve a problem that requires all of these things, the overhead is very, very high. So the hierarchy of knowledge, because you know, mathematics includes all of these things, includes physics, includes engineering, includes biology, includes the social sciences, and includes the humanities. So everything that is communicable is indeed mathematical. If it is not mathematical, you know, one equals two, if I say that to you, it means anything and everything. You know, one equals two also means one equals six, and three equals four, and four equals four. Okay? And if you look at the pattern of investment from PricewaterhouseCoopers, it sort of confirms this, you know, where are we investing? Because where the returns are the maximum, where the utilization is maximum. In social sciences and biology and humanities, pretty much. And the other side of this game is what happens if we are not growing. So just look at it. We have a system of caste and class that we're going to end up in if we are in senescence all the time. And people are going to climb socially. And then some are going to go down. And if whole countries get out, like Greece and Egypt, you have chaos. So it is very imperative that we do have growth curves. And we have growth curves that are really fast. And we cannot do this through politics or anything. We really need technology to do this so that Society is, you know, driven by this sort of growth 
and when everybody is working hard and they're actually making money, they're all happy, so you're not going to have breakdown and social problems and the like. So how do we make this escape? Because we have complex systems, you know, how do we convert many of these 19th century systems to modern systems? For example, we have chemical reactors in the 19th century, the Haber process. You think of petroleum refining or steel making. They're all essentially 19th century processes with 21st century automation, but nothing much more than that. So how do, we, how do we get out of this? The key is, if there is uncertainty, you've got to measure it, isn't it? If you measure directly, then you get rid of uncertainty. How do we do this in the integrated chip? We actually have measurement across every transistor and feedback over every transistor. Otherwise, you just cannot make an integrated circuit. You cannot make an integrated circuit that's going to work. Because when you have all these nano components, they're simply not going to be super reliable on average. So with the feedback loops, meaning measurement and control in that sense, they're very reliable. And if you look at this overall system, it's, you know, think of it as a computer. So it's got its sensing, you know, and its inputs. And nowadays you have distribu very distributed sensing because you're able to sense the whole world through Google and Google Maps and the like. And then you have a lot of different distributed models in there. The keyboard is different, the peripherals are different, the CPU and operating system, everything is designed differently. Okay? And the feedback you know, that goes from all of these things to the world or the market is also very different. So the key is we have to reduce uncertainty and its, and its propagation. So we can actually do all of these kinds of designs and break down the dimension of optimization problems that we are solving. And we also have to do it in a distributed fashion, as distributed as possible. Because if it is centralized, then you need big models. If you're, fi if you're trying to curve fit a curve with 10 parameters or a differential equation with 100 parameters, the pre precision of experiments that you need to fit those things is extremely high. Whereas if you're just fitting two parameters at a time, say a mass and a spring constant and something like that, it's easy. Okay? So we have to distribute if we want to improve things. And without the distribution, if we have massive centralization on the other hand, you know, we can end up with something like the Soviet Union. They actually got to their 1913 standard of living in terms of how much meat and bread they were putting on the table in 1991. Because they were optimizing the relative values of 11,000 different commodities. That's what their Politburo was doing. And they're, they're getting data, of course. By the time they used the data, the data was useless. And they were running these big optimization problems. So the key to all technical progress appears to be direct measurement and direct use of the data as much as possible. So I'll just give you an example of what we can do. In automotive, if you had a series hybrid and you had all the components coming around, you know, the wheels integrated with motors and so on and so forth, then you should be able to cut down the cost enormously. When you make it totally distributed and you have different people making the components, just as they make it for the PCs, just as they make it for computers and your cell phones and the like. So that is one exa direct example. And I have a whole bunch of recommendations of how we can go after many different problems over time. The one that I really like here is feedback and adaptation in agriculture. Because I could grow about 50 pounds of tomatoes or 50 pounds of cucumbers in three square feet of land by observing what is going on and supplying water when it is necessary and supplying fertilizer when it is necessary. Okay? So if we can do that in an automated fashion, with control systems and the like, and you have some human intervention, we solve the problem of both employment and social, social order in a single shot. If we want to preserve the environment, you know, somebody's got to profit from it. You know. If we milk the whales, you know, whale milk is the most nutritious, you know. Maximum protein, maximum sugar, maximum everything. That's what makes baby whales into adult whales. So if somebody, you know, makes money off of them, they're going to protect them. So there's a whole bunch of things that we can do, and hopefully many of you will, you know, do some of these things, and uh, we'll actually have a much, much safer and productive world where you're all going to get rich and be billionaires you know, compared to the, bil the billionaires of last century. Thank you.
happy. And there's a mic in the middle, or you can, it's a pretty small room if you want to just speak out. It sounds like a, a lot of what you're talking about has to do with optimizing the information sharing that exists between organizations and industries. And uh, so we have Twitter and we have Facebook and we have LinkedIn and, and we're starting to get to the point where uh, information technology uh, really enables diverse groups of people who are innovating in their own expert fields to share information and make that happen. We're also moving away from that in science, uh, from the centralized approach in science where peer-reviewed journals were the only way that, that scientists shared information to now having public domain systems where you know, the, the research is put out there. Um, do you have any other ideas or any comments to what I'm saying? Uh, well, what I'm we trying to say... Do we need a planetary say, operating system, essentially? Well, what I'm trying to say is uh, we have all of these innovations, you know, that's why this article that I was referring to called it Moore's Curse. Because, because of Moore's Law, we really haven't innovated anywhere else, right? We're working entirely on software and everything that's related to it. So the question is, why haven't we improved the automobiles? You know, why haven't we improved, improved the jetliners? Or why haven't we improved the chemical processes and the like? Because we haven't made, we haven't created all these high productivity curves in these areas. The sharing of information is all fine, but if you have a whole bunch of specialists who are driven by the system rather than internally driven, they're not going to come up with those new ideas, fundamentally new ideas. You have to have, you know, people who are true generalists, meaning they have depth of knowledge in multiple disciplines so that they can actually come up with these fundamental ideas. So we have to have that. Otherwise, you know, we are just, you know, getting all these 1%, 2% improvements, and now and then we get, you know, some nice improvement that gives you 10%, and you have a billion-dollar company. But we really need, you know, supply curves that will take us up fast.